After a physical examination, a man says to his doctor, give it to me straight, doc. I can take it. Tell me in plain English what's the matter with me. The doctor replied, I'll be frank with you. You are just plain lazy. The man says, okay, doc, that's fine, but now give me a scientific name for it so I can go home and tell my wife. God will not accept scientific answers as to why we have not fulfilled the work to which he has called us. Uh, would you turn with me to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 4. As you're turning there, let's go back to A.D. 60 to 62. Picture the Apostle Paul under house arrest. God, by the Holy Spirit, guides him to pen the book of Colossians. He writes the letter, has a sent to the church of Colossae. Imagine being Archippus, one of the members of the congregation, sitting in the congregation on a day that the letter is publicly read to all. Now before we take a look at that, what would the Apostle Paul write concerning you and your labor for the Lord? Colossians chapter 4, verse 17. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. Join me in prayer. Father, I thank you that the word of God is explicit it tells us ever so clearly how we should labor for the Lord. Father, may we not be lazy, but diligent stewards. You have entrusted us with spiritual gifts. May we use those gifts for your glory to build up the body of Christ. Father, speak today. Touch each heart, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Truth be told, we don't know a lot about Archippus. Uh, some have speculated that he is the son of Philemon. Uh, yet there is something common that we share with Archippus. This is for all of us. He received a ministry from the Lord, and so have we. The Apostle Peter writes in 1 Peter 4.10, as each one has received a gift. Minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. As each one, so that's every Christian, has received a gift, a charisma. The Greek term charisma derives from grace or favor. The ma ending means the result. So you are given, child of God, a spiritual gift. God has graced you and the result is that gift. So let's take this a little further. What is a spiritual gift? Let me share with you my definition. A spiritual gift is a supernatural ability given by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to the believer at the moment of salvation for the building up of the body of Christ. That's the idea of a spiritual gift. It's not something you are born with, not a talent, but something that God has given to you when you trusted in Christ, a supernatural ability in order that you might use that gift to build up, to edify your brothers and sisters in Christ. On this Labor Day weekend, let us contemplate five words, five words that I'd have you to ponder. The first term is labor. 
And as you are writing down the word labor, underline or highlight the L in labor. And now you're in Colossians, right over on the next page, 1 Thessalonians. Would you turn there with me to learn about this model church? Paul praises this church highly. And in 1 Thessalonians 1.3, Paul writes, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, you might want to observe of faith, labor of love, note the words of love, and patience of hope. Also, take to mind of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. Uh, all three terms, faith, love, and hope, Notice have the word of before it. These are descriptive genitives. In other words, when you see the words of faith, it refers to the description of the work that they're doing. Of love, the description of the labor that they have. Of hope, concerning the patience they exhibit. It describes those things. I trust you've noted the words faith, hope, and love. When you have those three components in individuals that make up your church, you have a mature church. But I want you to focus on the word labor, kapas, labor of love. The concept is toil, labor. That is wearisome effort. You are laboring to the point of exhaustion now that you're in first thessalonians we want to turn to the book of first corinthians first corinthians chapter three passage that deals with christ the foundation of the church and that one day all of us will have to stand before him because he's going to judge us concerning the works we have done in the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul asks, Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one. Paul went, he planted the church. Later on came Apollos. Verse 6, that's what's said here. I planted. Apollos watered, but notice the adversative, the strong contrast. But God gave the increase, and here's the result. So then, neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, once again, a strong contrast, but God who gives the increase, verse 8. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. Observe the unity. And each one will receive his own reward according to his own what? Labor. Serving to the point of exhaustion. I cannot represent you at the day of judgment, nor can you represent me. You're going to be there individually at the beam of seat. At the raised platform was the idea that a judge would sit behind. The people would stand before the judge. When Christ comes back at the rapture, we will stand before him as our judge. So it's going to happen individually to each and every one. We're in 1 Corinthians, spring forward to chapter 15. The resurrection chapter, such an important chapter contained within the chapter. I believe you have the most clear definition of the gospel. In verses 3 and 4, for I delivered to you First of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to Scriptures, that he was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Then Paul gives us the greatest detail about the future resurrection, what believers can expect. We do not serve God without hope. Even if we die before Christ comes back, there will be a day when we will be rewarded for the investment that we've made in the body of Christ. So as we end the chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse 58, a key verse. 
And notice the first word is therefore. Speaks of a conclusion. Based on everything that has just been shared, here's the conclusion. My beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always. That's an interesting term. Always abounding what? In the work of the Lord. Knowing that your labor, that's our same term we've been studying, is not in vain. It's not empty in the Lord. So we want to labor. We want to take this time on planet Earth that God has given to us. Take the spiritual gift imparted to us and use it for the enhancement of the church. So we have labor. Our second term is the word agonize. Underline or highlight the A. Agonize. And we have two passages we want to see. Uh, the first one is in 1 Timothy 6.12, and the second one is 2 Timothy 4.7. So why don't you turn 1 Timothy chapter 6 in verse 12. It's interesting to term agonize. Both the verb and the noun appear in 1 Timothy 6.12 and again in 2 Timothy 4.7. The idea of this term, it could be referred to a contest. And the individual who is competing is striving for victory because you have mastered the particular game. But you're, you're putting all your energy, all your effort to win the race, to beat your opponent in boxing or wrestling. It's a very intense word. So in 1 Timothy chapter 6, look at verse 12, observe the word fight. There we find our verb, agonizomai, and it's an imperative. Paul is not asking Timothy, and by way of extension, you and me, to do this. He's telling us to. By the authority of Almighty God. And then we'll see the word fight a second time, which will be the noun. So he says here, fight. Keep on fighting. It's a present imperative. The good, the good fight of faith. There's a lot of fighting that takes place in our world that is worthless, that is vain, that is destructive. Not so for the child of God who is fighting for the faith. The concept here of the good fight means good in quality or character. Paul is writing to his disciple in the faith. He calls him his son in the faith and his son, Timothy, and he says, fight. Think of the agonize. What? In the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Now over to 2 Timothy 4 in verse 7. These are the words we want to be able to say one day just before we die. Paul, shortly after writing this letter, has his head cut off as tradition tells us. But notice what he pens here to Timothy. I have fought. The perfect tense verb utilized by Paul carries the idea, I have fought in the past with the results continuing. I have fought. Once again, it's the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. That's what we need to do. We need to agonize. We need to labor for the Lord. That's our first word. And then we need to agonize in his service. And the third word I'd love to give to you now is blessed. Blessed. Underline or highlight the B in blessed. I want you to think about God's initial work. How about creation? And how often after a day of creation does God step back and he blesses the day, says it's good. And he gets to the sixth day. And let me read this to you from Genesis chapter 1 in verse 31. Then God saw everything that he made 
And indeed, it was very good. See, he blesses the work of his own hands. See, he blesses Adam later by giving him a terrain to manage. He puts him in the Garden of Eden. And he's supposed to stay focused on the work God gave him and then let God bring him his wife. And it's exactly what God did. And when God puts you as a child of God, a son or a daughter of God in the work of the Lord, you need a single person to stay focused upon that and let God take care of everything else. He does. But he blessed the day. Let's uh, turn now to the book of Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke in the New Testament, chapter 12. I loved preaching through the Gospel of Luke. It took me several years, and the lessons are so profound. The words of Jesus are just awesome. The principles, amazing. You have such a principle found here in Luke 12, 35 through 40. Jesus had just talked about the present. Don't worry about anything. Don't be anxious. God's going to take care of you. And then he transitions with his disciples to the future, what they need to be looking to, what they need to be anticipating. So in verse 35, observe the word your. Let your. It's emphatic. It's said strongly. And then down in verse 36, and it says, and you. The you is emphatic as well. Jesus is saying, you know, the world cares about these things, but you, this is what you need to care about. In verse 35, we have a command, let your waist be what? Be girded. In the first century, men and women would have a long robe on. And when they went to work or if they needed to run or if they needed to do something exerting energy, they would take, the flowing robe and they would tuck it in under their belt or sash that's the idea here anticipate service be ready let your waist be girded and your lamps burning in other words be watchful verse 36 and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master observe the term wait same word appears in Titus 2, 13. Looking, that's the word, for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In our context, it's used of the slave waiting for the master to return. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him and observe the word here immediately. Why? Because you've been waiting and watching for him. And then in verse 37, concerning the slave, the servant, the individual that's watchful, what is he? What is she? Blessed. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching uh, surely I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. Whoa! <laughs> Doesn't work this way in a master and slave economy. What's the tradition? Uh, we're going to come back here in just a second, so keep your finger here and go over to chapter 17. Luke 17, 7 and eight. Luke 17, 7 and 8. Let me tell you the norm right here. And which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat? It's not how it works. Verse 8. But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk and afterward you will eat and drink. How? Because they're going to get the food themselves. You serve the master, then you take care of yourself. But notice in verse 37, back here in Luke 12. Let me read this again. Put this in your minds. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Surely I say to you that he, see the master will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. 
The lesson for children of God serving their master. Here it is. Anticipate the master's return and he'll serve you. Wow. Verse 38. And if he should come in the second watch, this would be 9 p.m. to midnight, or come in the third watch, that would be midnight to 3 a.m., and find them so. What? Watching. The lamp is burning. They are anticipating. What is that servant? Blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken in two. See again, the concept of watchfulness, verse 40. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Yes, he blesses you and the labor of your hands when you do it in anticipation of his return. So our first term, labor. Second term, agonize. Third term, blessed. And now our fourth, organized. And some of you are cringing at this point. I don't want to get organized. Okay, organized. Underline or highlight the O in organized. Now, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And as you're turning there, I just want to explain something about the economy of God. In eternity past, there was what I call a holy huddle. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit got together and put together a game plan. In essence, the Father would one day have to send the Son. That's John 3.16. And one day the Father and the Son would send the Spirit. Each member of the Godhead, remember one God, three persons, has his own role. With that in mind, although you have diversity, there is unity. In 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, the topic consists of spiritual gifts. We now know the definition. Each one has at least one according to 1 Peter chapter 4. But notice at the end of the teaching, verse 40, 1 Corinthians 14, 40, let all things be done decently in what? And in order. God's church is to be organized. God's servant is to be organized. Organization is a good thing. God is not the author of confusion or chaos. When you pick it up with me now in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, let's look at verses 4 through 7. Now, I want to draw your attention to the word diversities. Verse 4. Translated, same Greek term, differences. Verse 5. And diversities. Verse 6. One and the same Greek term each time. The idea of our text here is that God the Spirit has, in conjunction with the Father and Son, given out spiritual gifts to the men and women that they have chosen. He's picked the individuals, his saints, and he's given each one a particular spiritual gift. Observe in verse there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Now, I want you to notice the Trinity's here because in verse 4, we have the same what? Spirit. Verse 5, there are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. Spirit, verse 4. Lord, Jesus Christ, verse 5. Verse 6, and there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God, that's the Father, who works all in all, even with the doling out of spiritual gifts. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, working together. We have diversity, but unity. The same thing is supposed to happen with spiritual gifts. It's, the analogy is the human body. 
We have one body, many body parts are all to function together. That's what is supposed to happen, child of God, with your giftedness. You are to use it for the glory of God to benefit not yourself. Remember the definition? For the edification of the body of Christ. That's why spiritual gifts are given. Now, verse 7, still in chapter 12 here in 1 Corinthians, but the manifestation, which means to make clear evident of the Spirit, is given to whom? Each one for the profit of all. Starting to get the idea of being organized, the importance of it now. Let's move to the end of the chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, coming down to verse 28. All the gifts are important, but certain gifts had a greater ability to build up the entire body than others. So there's a priority. See, the church needed to be organized, but they weren't. They took the lesser gifts, like tongues, and tried to make them the foremost. And it wreaked havoc in the church. And I want to point this out about spiritual gifts. A particular church can have all the gift in this, but it doesn't mean they'll be mature. In 1 Corinthians 1, 7, Paul says, you have come behind Corinthians in no spiritual gift. They had them all. But yet in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, he calls them divisive. He calls them babes in Christ in the first four verses. So just because you have giftedness doesn't mean you have maturity. That's why love is the next chapter because we need to use our giftedness with the attitude of love. Gifts are temporal Love is eternal. Now in verse 28, 1 Corinthians 12, and God has appointed these in the church, number one, apostles, second, prophets. And by the way, there are no longer apostles or prophets. They were foundational to the church. Ephesians 2.20 says, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And Paul uses a past tense verb. They were foundational. They're no longer Gifts given to the body of Christ. But notice now we have third teachers. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Then there are seven questions all prefaced with a may, which means no. The answer is no. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Do all have gifts of healings? No. Do all speak in tongues? No. Do all interpret? Because see, tongues were foreign language, and there's no purpose to them in the church unless you had an interpreter. Look at verse 31. But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. In other words, prioritize the gifts in the local assembly in the same way that they are prioritized, prioritized here in order to build up the body of Christ. You have to be organized. Chapter 14 and verse 1. Pursue love. Why love is eternal. Gifts are temporal. Go after love. And by the way, the three verbs found in chapter 14, verse 1, pursue, desire, and prophesy are all plural is speaking to the entire church. They are to work together. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Why? The Corinthians had taken the least of the gifts, tongues, made it the foremost. They should have had more teaching and prophecy done in the church because back at that time, individuals in the church were prophets. Supernatural revelation from God. They could predict the future. And they were to have a foremost position. But the Corinthians had botched it. So, we see the importance now of a church being organized. Number one, our first word, labor. Number two, agonize. Number three, blessed. Number four, organized. And now number five, recorded. Recorded. Underline VR in recorded. With that in mind, Hebrews chapter 6, please. Hebrews chapter 6 in verse 10. I've had the privilege to be at the same church for now over 40 years. 
And by the grace of God, I got active in ministry early on. So many things that I have participated in that I don't remember, don't remember the details. Acts of service for my Lord that I have long forgotten. But let me tell you the good news. God hasn't. He keeps a perfect record book. And even when you give someone a cup of cold water in the name of Christ, you get rewarded. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10, for God is not unjust to forget. See, he, he never forgets. To forget your work, and here it is, labor, familiar term, of love, which you have shown toward his name. See, you've done this for him, in that you have ministered to the saints, see, in the past, but you continue to minister. There will be reward. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive in the body the things that we have done for his glory is the idea, is the essence of 2 Corinthians 5.10. He's going to reward us. How beautiful is that? So let's pause for a moment. We have five words. Labor, agonize, blessed, organized, recorded. When you take the first letter of each of those words, it gives us the word labor. We need to labor for the Lord. This is our Labor Day weekend. On Monday will be the day that our government gives us traditionally a day off, a, a rest from our labor. It always happens there in the beginning of September. Now, with that in mind, I want you to think about laboring. And from the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 11, 28 and 29, because for you and me, child of God, we should have a focused labor. We know who we are serving and why. But so many are confused. And their labor is to merit them eternal life, to earn God's favor in order to be saved. Jesus gives an invitation in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28, and 29. Come to me. All you who, and notice her term, labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. It's an invitation to salvation. Sadly, the people to whom Christ came to win had religious leaders over them. Pharisees, scribes, Sadducees, and lawyers. And they were given bad information. People who claimed to know the Scripture well, but twisted the Scripture. Things haven't changed 2,000 years later. Turn with me now to Luke chapter 11. We want to take a look specifically at the lawyers individuals who were to be experts in the Old Testament Scripture. Notice in Luke eleven fifty two, Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. They did not teach the clear meaning of Scripture, but they had their own tradition that they added to it. Jesus continues, he says, You did not enter in yourselves, and those who were entering in you hindered because of their abuse of the Word of God. Since they added tradition to the Word, people were confused. Such a dangerous thing. I find it fascinating as I study the New Testament, the New Covenant. The one that was to replace the old, as we learn from the writer of Hebrews, chapter 8, is that the first covenant would become, what? Obsolete. Nullified. Why? Because Christ came with a specific purpose in mind. Jesus did not compete against the law. Jesus, the only one, came to fulfill the law. And you and I ought to be so thankful for that. 
But yet as I study the New Testament, what's the issue? So often, people try to add the law to grace. It's a dangerous thing. They attempt to take the Old Testament commandments like keeping the Sabbath. On and on and on. And say, you need to do these things on top of believing on Christ. The group of people were called Judaizers. But in Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, and don't miss this, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Why would anyone go back to the law? The law was a mirror to show us our sinfulness, but the law also had a person it pointed to. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus is walking after he's raised from the dead incognito with two disciples headed to Emmaus, a seven-mile trek northwest of Jerusalem. And as he walked with them, they were downcast because their hope, the Messiah, had died. So what did Jesus do? He opened the Word to them. He took them through the Old Testament Scriptures and showed them ever so clearly that those Scriptures pointed to the Messiah. That He would suffer and die and conquer death. And what was their response? Luke 24, 32. Did not our hearts burn as He was opening the Word to us? This is what Jesus did. In the Gospel of John, the one Gospel that's written specifically to tell you how to be saved, that you might know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, not by doing, you might have life in His name. And in John 5, 39, he's speaking to the religious hierarchy, the leaders. He says, you search the scriptures and in them you think you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me. They crucified the one to whom the law pointed, the only one that could ever fulfill the law. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So what do we have? I'll tell you what we have. Individuals, even today, who are looking backward, not forward. Individuals that are putting burdens and conditions upon others. And may I say ever so clearly, leading individuals to the path of hell. We should get mad over this topic when you have people giving a false gospel. Paul did. In Galatians 1, he says in verse 6, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you into the grace, see the favor of Christ, to a different gospel. Then in verse 8 he says, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than which we have preached to you. Let him be a curse. Let him be damned by God. So when I'm hearing of someone say, you need to keep the law. You need to tithe. Or you need to keep the Sabbath. You need to. You need to. You need to. Remember what Christ says? It is finished. Paid in full. And fools promote a false gospel. Not only are they going to hell when they add to the clear gospel message concerning the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, they're pointing others to hell too. Paul says, let them be damned by God. I do not applaud those people. Not if once was enough. Verse 9, as we said before, so now I say again, if anyone, 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 don't care if they're wearing a clerical robe, don't care if they're just ignorant because they're unwilling to study the Word of God, they're just plain lazy at times, unteachable. 
if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Wow. I'm tired of individuals keep looking back when Christ came to fulfill the law. I want you to think about the law. Romans chapter 10, you can stay in Galatians. I'm coming right back to Galatians. Listen to Romans 10, 4. For Christ is the end of the law. What is it people don't get? He is the end of the law. It's the idea he's the goal. He's the terminus of the law. For what? Righteousness. To everyone who, and I love the word, believes. In the Greek sentence, the first word that appears is end. Why? Because it is fulfilled. It is completed. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Christ fulfilled the law. When we believe in him as our substitute, he declares us righteous. He puts into our account righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he, God, made him Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's the essence of the gospel. So keep your Sabbath. Keep your tithe. Keep adding from adding baptism to salvation. Jesus paid it all. When I put my faith in him, he declares me righteous. Therefore, having been justified, declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do not entertain bad doctrine, bad teaching, liars. Don't ever sit under them. Do not exalt them. Do not give them an excuse. But if you come upon them, preach Christ to them and Christ alone. I want to close you out with Galatians chapter 2. Down in verse 16, because I want your soul to rest. The poor people in Jesus' day could not rest because they had all these burdens imposed upon them concerning the law that they could never keep and beyond the law. 2.16 Galatians, knowing that a man is not justified by what? The works of the law. Can it be any clearer than that? You are not declared righteous by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Traditionally here in Jesus Christ has been viewed by scholars as an objective genitive. He's the object of our faith. In the last decade or so, scholars have re-examined these words. And they're coming, many of them, to the conclusion it's not an objective genitive, but a subjective genitive based upon the grammar. The idea is knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faithfulness of Christ. He alone fulfilled the law. He alone took our place. The one who knew no sin became sin for us. He alone is the Lamb of God. He alone could do this. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified. How? By faith in Christ or the faithfulness of Christ. Not by the works of the law. Let me say this again. Not by the works of the law. And then notice how Paul wraps it up. For by the works of the law, no flesh, no individual shall be justified. 
You don't get a get into heaven free card if you don't believe on Christ and him alone in his finished work. When you're adding anything to grace, it is no longer grace. So if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, the invitation is for you. Jesus says, come unto me. He's the one who knew no sin. He's the one who satisfied the wrath of God by his perfect sacrifice. He's the one who will extend to you the gift of eternal life for believing in him. The one who died for your sin and conquered death. Believe. Enter into that rest. And for those of us who know him, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Salvation is a free gift, but then, for we are his workmanship. This is Ephesians 2.10. Created in Christ Jesus, what? For good works. Let's labor, let's agonize, let the work of our hands be blessed, let's be organized, and it will be recorded that we have served him well. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Labor Day weekend, I pray some would come to find rest in your Son, Jesus Christ, by believing in his finished work. And for those of us who have the privilege of knowing you. May we put these five words into practice that our labor in your sight might be sweet. I ask in Jesus' name.